Welcome to the Suicide Prevention Show. We're waking up the world to the idea that while suicide is serious, suicide prevention can be seriously fun. And to take us even further into this realm, we're going to be talking with Reverend Carrie Ann all about dreams, destiny, and divinity. So hang on. The ride gets more interesting from here, especially if you help me welcome to the studio, Reverend Carrie Ann. And poof. Am I there? Well, you're halfway here. There you are. (laughs) Hello. (laughs) Good morning. Good evening. Whatever time of day it is. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing pretty amazing. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Oh, I'm I'm really excited excited to have you here. Yeah. So, dreams, divinity, and I've already forgotten the other one. Oh, my God. Destiny. 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 Yeah. All right. So, for someone, me, who destiny is a word that I have no clue about, we're going to spend some time unpacking that one for everybody. But first, how the heck dreams, I mean, you're a reverend. Divinity, I get. Mm -hmm. Dreams, I get. Destiny, it all makes absolute sense under the context of being a reverend, but you weren't always a reverend. Oh, no. (laughs) No, no, no. So take us on the journey to get to know you. Oh, wow. Okay. I'll try to do the short version. I've I've been known to tell a short story very long, so I'll try (laughs) to do the opposite here. (laughs) Um, I actually grew up in a small, small town in uh, Manitoba, Canada, a very small town. Um, I was a a son of a daughter of a a potato farmer. And so I know actually the complete cycle of a life of a potato. So that's here and right here, but it sets the tone for where I'm going. (laughs) You grew up knowing the life cycle of a potato. Yes. Yeah. From seed to to consumption. Anyways, um, I love potatoes. That's the short story of that. Um, So, yeah. So I um, went to college in my early uh, teens, like after I graduated from high school, I took business administration. And then I found myself in a job which would be considered a life for job with a corporate uh, crown corporation, working with people doing uh, customer service and marketing and helping them with all their billings and et cetera, et cetera. So I got quite uh, comfortable with, um, with policies and processes and all of that fun stuff. And then I found myself up in a northern community in Manitoba called The Poth. By the time I was 25, I had a home, a car. Um, I I was set up from everyone else's perspective. I was set up for life. And I pulled in. You're talking picture perfect, everything just falling into line with the. not even the American dream, with the culturally accepted milestones of success. Exactly. Everyone was happy. I was supposedly happy, but I wasn't. I had been diagnosed with epilepsy when I was uh, 21, 22. And three years later, I was sitting there and I'm like, I, I pulled into my driveway after work. And I was like, is this all there is to life? Like I'm taking up, taking this medication for my epilepsy. I've got this perfect job, but I still felt empty. Like I felt like something was missing. So I, 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 I was, I really asked that question. Is there, is this all there is to life? Right. And so I I needed to start exploring. Um, so I picked up a book called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. I'm sure we've all heard of that one. <laughs> well, we haven't read the book. We have certainly heard the saying yes. probably. If you're listening yeah. to the show. Don't yeah. sweat the small stuff. It's all small stuff. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So I, uh, short story, um, started reading books. I read about the Celestine prophecy and how there is something bigger than us. And, you know, we might have different realms and everything like that. Um, so I just kept wanting more. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to find out more. I wanted to be like more than what I was. Not that I wasn't happy where I was. I just knew there was more than there could be. And with the diagnosis of epilepsy, there came a lot of, uh, 
um, anger and resentment and like, why did this happen to me? Thoughts, I want a different life. I don't want to be here anymore, but I never wanted to be gone. I just wanted something different than what I had. So I started doing all this exploring. You get that. I've got to pause this, pause for one second, because what you just said is one of the most succinct explanations of what's true when people are contemplating suicide. Mm -hmm. It's not that they want to die. It's just they want a way out of the life that they're currently living. And there's so many other ways than that choice. And yet getting stuck in the cycle of negative thinking, it ends up where people see that as the only option or the best option at the time, which is what we know is the decision-making point of action. Mm-hmm. But coming back to this is that this is the reality of many people's lives. It's, it's not that they want to destroy anything. It's just that they don't want the life that they've got. And when you've got the life that has all of the check boxes, mm-hmm. what makes a good life? And you're going, I don't want this. It's not enough. It's not, you know, whatever it is, it's not. I want more. You had a large sense of betrayal because your body wasn't, this wasn't the body you signed up for. No. (laughs) What's the life you thought you were going to live with a body that needed to be managed because of seizure? Right. But, But yes, so that was my belief at the time. I wanted something different than what I had. So I love the way that you summarize that. So I just started exploring more about spirituality. One of the biggest things, the first lesson I learned was to be grateful and to forgive everyone and everything that was happening to me. Um, So I started thanking the cashiers at the grocery store every single time, every single cashier. It's like, thank you for working today. I really appreciate it. Didn't matter how many people are in line. I it's, it's a practice I still do today, especially now frontline workers need to hear that more than ever. But since I've been 25, I've been thanking, thank you for working today. Thank you for being here today. I appreciate it. So I've been living in that 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 place of appreciation. Uh, Fast forward a few years, um, I had come to another space where I was like, okay, my seizures have been under control for eight years, so I could go off the medication. By that time, I found I was sort of married to my job, so to speak, right? I didn't have any friends that didn't support that were outside of my work or my volunteer work or my committee work and I, again I found myself like wow I've built something else for me I've moved into the big city of Winnipeg <laughs> some people will joke that Winnipeg's a big city but to me it was coming from this small town and I just I was at this point again where is this all there is I had reached as far as I could on what they call the corporate ladder without going. I continued to seek more development, education, professional, all of these amazing things, right? And it just, it positioned me great, but I was always second on the list. And I could not get that dream job or the next job I was supposed to have, quote unquote. Ah. So after we do 12 postpone years. postpone happiness, don't we? Yes. You know, yes. We get the job and then we postpone happiness until we get the better job. And then we get the better job and we postpone happiness until we get the corner office. And then exactly. Wow. And what was actually happening as I was hitting that 12 year mark is some of the older individuals that could have retired at 55, but didn't. They stayed on till they were 70, like 57, 58, 60. And what happened is a lot of the, the men or the individuals that I started working with, they were passing away within six months because they didn't know what to ha- what to do if they didn't have their job. When they so retired, they were dying. Um, they, they were I- like, happens with business owners and entrepreneurs as well that yeah. they're not prepared for the shock of not having the adrenaline rush exactly and their bodies just don't handle it well so when so when a few of these individuals i could see what they were doing they were living their life for their job and then i did some reflection and i was like this is what's happening to me. I can't see myself sitting here for the next 25 years till I hit 55 and then to not have anything to look forward after that. So 
again, it was a, I'm, I'm very appreciative of what I have, but it's not what I want. My, my soul's still calling for something more. So I made the, I, I did some research and I was able to take a leave of absence, a two year leave of absence. And during this time, I, I, I don't want to admit it, but this is when online dating first began. Ah. So I met this lovely young fellow <laughs> who lived in Calgary. <laughs> and uh, I, I took advantage of the leave of absence for two years. And suffice to say, when I got here, um, I didn't know who I was without my job. I, I felt completely lost. I came here in search for balance between my personal and professional life. But when I got here, I didn't have a professional life. And I really didn't know who I was without my job. Mm -hmm. So that put a lot of strain on that supposed white picket fence relationship. So back and forth, back and forth, seizures came back. You know, oh, that's an interesting phenomenon. Yes. And then when I went to the doctors here, they told me that it was just stress and anxiety. So now I didn't have an, uh, a diagnosis of epilepsy. I had a diagnosis of extreme panic and anxiety, which was just blew my mind. So again, anger, resentment, all of that stuff came up for me. Trying to rebuild this life, didn't know who I was. So I have a choice. I don't want to be here anymore. What do I do? I don't want this. What do I want? So I actually called in a life coach. I found out about fearless living and uh, it's all about mastering your emotional fear. Long story short, um, it, it, I started to understand that I needed to love myself first even though I knew that from some of my trainings or from yeah, my readings. I mean, we, we all know that, right? We yeah. all need to learn to love ourselves first. But it's a lot harder. To, it's easier to say harder to practice. Yes. Right? Yes. So when you're talking unconditional love. Yes, exactly. So for the next 10 years, I practice unconditional love. I figured out what my negotiation, what my uh, non-negotiable boundaries were, what I was willing to to do what I was willing to, what was most important to me and what wasn't. So obviously that relationship ended and I found myself <laughs> in Calgary, <laughs> totally so, alone. Once you got clear on your non-negotiables, it wasn't it was that. Like, it really, it was like, let's sit down. This is what I need from you. And oh, you're not willing to give me that. Okay, let's be adults and just walk away. Let's not make our life work worse than we have to be. So that started a whole journey that opened up the spirituality for me that allowed me to, I will let, let you pause that because yes. that's a great line. Thank you. This is what I need from you. Getting that clarity about what you need in a relationship. What, what a huge, huge leap for so many people to actually be willing to say, not this is what I want, but this is what I need. This is what I must have from you for the relationship to work and not to buy into, well, of course I can do that, but to look at what their actions are. What are they actually willing to do? Not just willing to say, and it sounds like you went through that with him. And I just wanted to highlight this Thank you. so that people get it. It wasn't hard. Well, it might've been hard. It wasn't complicated but it required clarity. Right. And what my coach helped me understand, my life coach at the time was, there was all these expectations that were being, what I thought were put on me. And I actually remember saying, everyone in my life expects something different from me. And I feel like I've got multiple personalities and there's a whole bunch of expectations that are put on me. She asked me this pinnacle question, Okay, I'm gonna yeah. pause, pause, pause one second because this is a chattable thing. Hey guys, okay. have you related to that? <laughs> what, what Reverend Carrie had just said, that she felt like she had multiple personalities trying to deal with multiple other people's multiple expectations. Everybody expected something different from you. Mm -hmm. 
That's really cool. Okay. So that's a pretty common experience in, in my own practice that I hear this from people and I've certainly lived it enough times. Yeah. All right. Lay it on us. Now that we've picked right. it up, what's the pivotal question? Did they actually say they expect that from you? Ooh. And nine, uh, 99% of the time was no, they did not actually say those specific words that they expect me to be this specific way and to act this specific way. So I ended up, they were my own expectations of what I thought they expected from me. Oh, big shift. <sighs> big shift. So then the next step was, what? why am I expecting so much from myself when no one else in my life is? I had been married to my job. I was expecting all of these things. I was doing everything I thought everyone was expecting me to do. And I was unhappy. So then I really had to tap into what, do, what makes me happy. And that was hard to do to figure that out because I had never had my own identity, even though I knew this isn't what I wanted. It's so easy to know what you don't want. <laughs> it's super hard to figure out what you do want unless you practice this. You take the negative, what you don't want, and you spin it and turn it into something positive. So if I don't want someone who's financially irresponsible. I do want someone who is financially responsible. If I don't want to feel, I can't even come up with any other, but you know, like it's just, if I don't want that, what do I want? If I don't want a partner who only looks at the TV and never looks up when I walk into the room, I want someone to acknowledge my presence when I walk into the room. And so, then it came to be, yeah. if I want love, I need to practice being love. I need to practice giving love. So, so back to the story of acknowledging gratitude, expressing appreciation for the, the person behind the counter when you check yeah. out of the grocery store. And, and the more you... So uh, I started to practice. I There's... there's um. In Fearless Living, Rhonda Brennan is absolutely brilliant. And, and I give her credit where credit's due, but so many of the principles that she applies are universal, but it's the way in which she applied it. There's an, she calls what is an intention statement. It's not an intent, I intend to complete this or I intend to do that. It's an intention of being, how do you wanna be in the world? How do you wanna show up in the world? How are you willing to show be? And that's where the destiny comes in and the divination comes in is who do I want to be? Who am I expected? Who do I want to be? Who am I? And just be willing. How do I do that? Right? So the intention statement starts with, I am willing to practice being. Oh, yes. Now I get it. I okay. am willing to practice being. And, and that's, really, really cool because a statement of willingness is very different than trying to work with positive affirmation. Right. So a statement of willingness. Hmm. Statement I'm of willing to practice. It doesn't mean I have to do it. I have to be it. I'm willing to practice it. it I puts, love this. It takes all the pressure off. Yeah. It, it, cool. it, 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 it's a sense of accountability, but it gives you, cuts you some slack. The word practice means I don't have to be this way all the time, but mm -hmm. I'm willing to practice being this way. So mine was, I am willing to practice living in a constant state of gratitude, in a constant state of appreciation, in a constant state of happiness, but appreciation and gratitude and really gr going back to that original learning at 25 where being thankful 10 years later, I'm like, I am willing to practice living in a constant state of gratitude. Oh, wow. So the more you're grateful, the more gratitude comes back into your life. And the more you start to see how the world is working for you instead of against you. 
It's really interesting, this concept. Um, one of my mentors, a man named Damana Guy, says that your body cannot tell the difference between gratitude and success. That it's the same physiology, it's the same emotional state. Um, and so that by practicing gratitude, you're actually exercising this muscle for success. I love this exercise and where it's going. So you started practicing, you started being, I love this, you started being willing to practice living in a state of constant gratitude. And this, yeah, and that was at the pivotal point where I had to decide, do I want to go back to Manitoba after two years? Oh. Do I want to go back to the same life I had before I moved? to Calgary. Do I want to go back and be a lifer and know my guaranteed outcome, my guaranteed destiny? That was on the table. They were willing to pay for my travel back home, put me up in a hotel until I found a place to, to plant myself. It was, again, picture perfect. Outside yeah. looking in, why would you say no to that? And I did, because it wasn't what I wanted. So the simple answer is it wasn't what you wanted. Exactly. So the logical brain wants the list. I would say no to this because. And did you end up writing a list? Or no. Or did you just go with the simple? It was more about feelings and emotion. How do I feel about this? Does this make me feel good? Does this make me feel happy? And it wasn't. So I chose, I chose and choice is a big part of my journey to where I found myself today is I chose to stay and rebuild myself from the ground up. When I made that decision, I had a can of tuna, a crackers, my, my laptop and a bed in my apartment. And I made the decision to stay instead of go back to certainty because I knew I wouldn't be happy if I went back. So that brought me to the awareness of I am open to my destiny to figure out where I want to go. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, the, the, the phrase I heard is I would rather, and at this point I was still in sort of in that, mindset of that's the devil I know versus the devil I don't. <laughs> so I would rather deal with the devil I didn't know than the devil I did know. That's a very gutsy, gutsy thing because most people would rather deal with the devil they know. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the tried and true, the comfort zone. The unknown, the unknown is scary for so many of us. Mm. Yeah, but well, it's solutionally, also, we have good reason to be scared of the unknown. Yeah, but it's also, if we can reframe it, the most empowering position we can be in, because that gives us an opportunity to be more than what we are, already are. Oh, so that's where the living in gratitude, trusting, living in a concentrated gratitude really came in. At that time, I was introduced to another teacher, his name's Dr. Jelicic, Dr. J for short. And we did a flower reading. So suddenly I, I was finding myself in a group where we were talking about energies and auras and past lives. And I'm like, how did I find myself here? I just decided not to go back to Manitoba. <laughs> but suddenly the whole world opened up to me. <laughs> so you went from boardroom to breath work. Exactly. <laughs> it was like whoosh, very like sticking up. And one of the key messages he, he said to me is in your life up until this point, you have seen, um, you know, people keep saying you're very aggressive and very, you, you keep trying to tell them the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And they're just not picking it up. They're not picking up what you're laying down. So they're misconstruing how you're coming across in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, just know that you, what you need to tell them, they will hear when they're ready to receive. 
You do not need to keep repeating it. You do not need to keep telling them this message. When their soul, and that's the first time I had really heard the word soul, when their soul or their higher self is ready to receive the message you want to give them that you so emphatically know they need to hear <laughs> that they yeah. will receive it and they will receive it in due time when their soul is ready to hear it. Oh, that's such a lovely conversation. Oh my God, because we have sign language in my family. You know, this stands for something called corrective complex. It means that I'm giving people information that they didn't ask for, yeah. you know, like yeah. almost like taking them to should build, you know, you should do it this way. Oh, yeah, you could do it this way. No, nah, if they didn't ask for it. Yeah. So what a great reminder of where if people can't pick it up, why are we continuing to lay it down? Exactly. Why are we wasting our energy on insisting they learn the lesson? Just trust that their higher self has heard it and they'll receive when they need it. Cause that's what impo what's important. Oh, but that was amazing. also the session or the, the moment when I realized when he shared with me that you are here to help educate, you are here to help inspire, help motivate others along their spiritual journey. I mean, I've used those exact words, but that was the, the message. He goes, you, do you just start talking? And you're like, where the, does this stuff come from? And I'm like, yeah, all this, like, I don't even know what, I have never thought about these things. And they're just, and he's like, that's just your old soul, your intuitive self higher self sort of just it's that psychic ability right it's that that knowing that claircognizant knowing okay so yeah there's a lot of names for it claircognizant knowing um it is not everyone's gift but it is sometimes a very disconcerting gift to have mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. now you had somebody who is identified and given a a framework for an experience that you have very well and an experience as to why I wasn't happy where I was, even though I should be right. Yeah. And why I was never happy in that relationship when I should have been. So there was a lot of shoulds. So anyways, so I just continued on with that path. I practiced these teachings. I practiced these learnings enveloping these awarenesses Next thing I knew, I was fun. I was in a class learning about angels and the nine healing angels and gifts. And it was like I had a total what we call a psychic turn of experience where it's like, yeah, OK, I guess I feel kind of different, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But it was really learning how to trust my intuition, why I was willing to practice living in a constant state of gratitude, while I was willing to be loving in all of my relationships. So I really started to understand how to connect to my intuition. We all have the, that intuition, but it's the awareness of it. And I'm, I wonder if anyone else is like, you're hearing these things or you're thinking these things and you're like, where are these things coming from? Is this my voice or is it someone else's voice? And that's what intuition, that's what figuring out the intuition was. Now, I want to caveat that with when she was saying there's expectations in my life, she also asked, where are those expectations coming from? Where and also beliefs beliefs around mm -hmm. um, foods and uh, clothing and reputations and ego and behaviors and, mm -hmm. you know, traditional thoughts. And I was really encouraged to start thinking about whose voice am I hearing those thoughts and beliefs from? Ah. Whose voice am I hearing? Grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, <laughs> teachers. <laughs> So now you really do know where your multiple personalities were coming from. Exactly. Yeah. In a, in, a, in a loving way, or like in a really loving way. Yeah. It was, oh, yeah. Because oh. people don't give us these messages for any reason other than to keep us safe, to help us grow. They're doing their best to help. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. They're and doing they, it out of love yeah. to try to keep you safe. And, and I love them for it. And I don't have any ill will. Thank you, mom and dad, if you're watching. <laughs> I know my grandparents are listening from above. 
<laughs> so, so but it was it's journey. really amazing. Yeah, it's been quite the journey. And then I found myself um, teaching the concepts of uh, non-physical guides, connecting to your non-physical guides, learning to trust your intuition and your skills. Had a few more mentors throughout there. But what was the biggest um, aha, one of the bigger aha moments is when I found out about soul path and soul path. Um, it's really, it's, it's your metaphysical DNA, your spiritual personality profile. It helps uncover your gifts and your greatness, but also identify the pitfalls and why you keep having the thoughts and the behaviors and the patterns repeating so in your life. Soul path. It was the tool that helped you the most. And I know you use it to help other people. What was the observable difference? Because I'm always about not the concept, but mm -hmm. the, the concrete, universal, and picturable outcome of using it. So going down the journey to learn and to work with this uh, next tool, because yeah. along the way, you've learned a few. I've learned a few. I've learned a few. Affirmations, gratitudes, calm, you know, I am statements, but there's definitely something different about this teaching. So what was different? What was the experience of it? What was the outcome of it for mm. you? You know, when I, when I received it, it was actually triple spiritual. So there's seven different categories of spiritual spirit, uh, soul path categories. And okay. Uh, so I, I get that. that that's okay, sorry. Process. So what I want to know is the outcome. The so you, you got that uh, you got the education, you got I, experience of how you fit into that education. What impact did that have on your life? It explained everything I had been experiencing, all of the patterns, all of the people that have been drawn into my life. It explained and it to explained to me what my key life experiences were what my spiritual needs were, what my characteristics were, how people saw me, how I saw myself. And, and I'm so good about that. It really, really helps you cut yourself some slack. <laughs> oh, there we go. Now we're talking an outcome that I would be near and dear to my heart. Yeah. It, it helps you cut yourself some, so Reverend, Carrie Ann, what changed in your life when you started cutting yourself some slack? I was reminded of my strengths and my power and what I was actually capable of doing. And so when you were reminded of your strengths and your power and what you were actually capable of doing, what did you do next? I stood up for myself and I chose the path that I wanted and I wasn't willing to be as people pleasing as I was in the past because that was part of what comes with the life experience I'm here. What I learned is I'm here to master and guide rather than direct and control. And I have been trying to direct my life path. I've been trying to control my life path mm -hmm. rather than allowing myself to be open to what is could be in my life. So what I learned was I had the ability and what I realized is I had been doing this all along. And it, it not only clarified a whole bunch of why things kept happening to me, but also why I was constantly presented with the opportunity to reshape my reality into something bigger and better. It reminded me that I had the ability to do something different than what I'm experiencing. I think you just answered my question. My question is, what is the word this in that sentence when you said, I've been doing this my whole life? Mm -hmm. What is, I've been doing this all along. What was this? in your words, because I think you answered it, but I'm really not quite a hundred percent sure. I've been doing this. What's this? Making choices to make my life better. Got it. 
right? It's, it's empowering. It's when you find out, oh, when you're in that moment and you say, I don't want this anymore. How do I get out? And then you make the choice to be and do something different, to think and feel something different rather than I'm just giving up. Okay. So there's that victim mindset and there's the empowerment mindset. You have the choice to pick one or the other. I love coming back to the choice. That, That is such a wonderful place to be. So the history of boardroom, epilepsy, relationships, you know, all of these things that looked like they were all controlled. Mm-hmm. All, you had your life under control. Yeah. You gave all of that up, experienced this journey into a whole new world, a new way of being, and now you've been playing with it for a while. Mm-hmm. So, What's been the outcome of this? You know, what are I, the observable things that are going on? I know what you're getting at. And that's one of the most interesting parts of a spiritual journey is there's less in, it's, it's less about the tangible and it's more about the intangible. It's more about how you feel when you wake up in the morning. Mm-hmm. It's more about your emotions. It's what's happening to you energetically. When you're looking at things in the world, what brings you happiness? What are you hearing? Are you hear the birds chirping? Does it bring happiness to you? Looking at the kids on the street, do you smile? Do you say, thank you for stopping at the stop sign so you don't run into me? It's all about, that's what it brings into your life. It brings happiness. It brings it's, it's that emotion. It's, it's being aware of how you were feeling in that moment and understanding what's happening to you energetically. And that's the most tangible thing. That's the most fundamental thing to your happiness is having that awareness of how you're feeling and having the awareness that you have the choice and you have the ability to make that choice. You have the choice. And that's, to me, is the biggest tangible thing that you can explain. I am now, I I have my spiritual practice, which started as a life coaching practice. I now call it a spiritual practice. It is an actual ministry. I'm registered with the government of Alberta as a metaphysical ministry. I can marry individuals. I can do funerals, baptisms, wedding renewals. I can marry same-sex couples, traditional couples, but all from a metaphysical um, belief as a religion. I have clients from all around the world. Um, I teach. um, I'm mentoring some amazing individuals who are having extreme shifts in how they view themselves within a matter of weeks. Uh, One person, uh, one client in particular, she really knew what she didn't want. Mm -hmm. So we worked through what she did want and she explained what her dream job was. And within the nine weeks of working together, By week number eight, she had the offer for a job that was $20,000 more than what she was making in her current role. The the tangibles are incredible. The, the, I, I can't stop thinking about this to, I can't wait to do this. That shift is so powerful. Oh, that's, that's, that's in competition for the quote of the show. The shift from... I can't stop thinking about this to I can't wait. And I love what you said. And now my brain is going, what? Uh, My brain doesn't remember most of what I say either. (laughs) That's why we record everything. Okay, this is why I'm such a big proponent of of people being able to get the recordings. Yeah. I, I can't stop thinking about this, meaning thinking about what she didn't want. Right. I can't stop thinking about what I don't want. We've all probably been there to some extent at some point yeah 
and shifting that to, I can't wait for the next thing to unfold. Exactly. I can't wait to see what's coming next. I can't wait to see what the universe is bringing to me. I can't wait to see the person, the people, the places, the situations, the settings. What is the next amazing thing that's going to happen to me? Instead of thinking, what's the next bad thing that's going to happen to me? I love the way you laid it out because what most people get stuck in is the I'll feel better when my circumstances change as opposed to what we know based on your experience and on mine is that when I decide to feel better, when I start to take control, when I start to reclaim my choice, my circumstances change. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a truism. They, they, it is. The but focus you know, on happiness makes a big difference. And I can't honestly remember who I learned this from, where I learned it. I know I learned it somewhere within the last 25 years. But what I do remember them saying is you can put in all the positive language you want into your day. But unless you're willing to remove the negative language, mm -hmm. the negative language will sift through your brain before the positive because it's what it's used to hearing. Well, it's an so, evolutionarily sound way to be. I mean, it's the natural negative bias that allowed our caveman ancestors to survive. We are hardwired for the negative. And what's the and I love that you brought that up because one of the biggest differences, emotional fear, which what we're trying, which is what leads people to that those suicidal thoughts, is the body responds the same to physical fears and emotional, physical threats and emotional threats. The body identical. does not know the difference between a real threat or an imaginary threat. I the mean, only, or remembered the, threat. So the only way you can change that is by reminding yourself, even though I feel this way, I'm okay. I am safe. I am well. I am good. I am capable. This is not a physical, I am not going to die because the person in line in front of me is, you know, chewing their gum too loud or whatever it is, right? Oh, and it can be these little, these things that somebody else would call a minor annoyance, mm -hmm. but for, for in the moment, it can be like a Chinese water torture. Exactly. You know, yeah. The this, this super simple drop of water that can drive somebody insane, we're exposed to them these kinds of stimuli all the time. We just don't give them credit for being so powerful. And I think, I, well, I don't think, I know that this is all part of putting things into context, mm. right? I know there's, um, for a while there, I thought I had PTSD for, I, you know, I had the epilepsy and then I was told I had the stress and the anxiety disorder. So along with that comes fear of squirrel germs, you know, not touching the same elevator buttons. And we're living in a slightly different world. So some of those feelings are justified now, but you should be able to feel comfortable walking barefoot in your apartment without worrying about germs attacking you <laughs> or, you know, worrying about what other people are thinking about you or worrying about how much money you don't have in the bank, you know, and, and all of that money. stuff, like yeah, all of that, all the things we don't want, all the things that come with that stress and that anxiety disorder and putting those things into context. And I, I heard this before when I was much younger is, Ask yourself, is this going to matter in 10 or 20 years from now? You know, but I, you, you hear it. Yeah. But now in this day and age, more than ever, putting things in context really support all of us in maintaining our mental health and wellness. It is absolutely a true thing. Putting them in context of a larger perspective, which adults can do because we have a prefrontal cortex. And teens cannot because they don't have a fully developed prefrontal cortex. So right. to put this in, in context, I came up with a question that works for everybody, mm -hmm. which is what's happening now? Is this happening now as a way to break that focus right. on the fear and to, to sort of open up a little bit of space? What I want to know, what impact did this have, if any, 
on your physicality, on the epilepsy, on the seizures? I was, um, I completed Ironman Canada in 2012 in 16 hours, 52 minutes and 10 seconds. So for those of you who don't know what an Ironman triathlon is, is that is a, I think it's a 3.8 kilometer swim mm -hmm. followed by a 180 kilometer bike ride mm -hmm. followed by a full marathon. Mm -hmm. so 2.4 K miles, 110 uh, miles, and then whatever the full mm -hmm. marathon is. I was able to do that but really what the, the physicality is, and I will, I, I will share with you all that my, my seizures actually did come back in January mm. because of all of the stress that was going on. And I was like, I don't want to be here. I want to be somewhere else. So my seizures did come back. But what's different is I've accepted taking those meds and I'm respecting my body so much better. And now there's like it's just it's just I just feel better too like I I just feel better and I don't know I know what you're looking for but it's no it's not what I'm looking for I'm looking for what's true it, what's, I'm not looking for a specific outcome what and what you just shared was so way more important to me than you sharing oh and my seizures are gone forever and I'm no longer epileptic I don't that's not what I'm looking for no. I was looking for what was true because what was true is that the shift has nothing to do with the diagnosis. The shift has to do with the attitude of I can take care of myself and not judge it as being wrong. Exactly. It's not and, putting on yourself around. And it also gave me the ability to appreciate what I do have. Now I've been in a committed relationship for three years. We have a four month old puppy. We have a classic car in the garage. We have our G6. We, we, we're renting, but we're, we've got dreams of what our ideal home is going to be. And I am so grateful that they're in my life to remind me of all of the goodness and that there's love within my house and that I'm safe and that I have someone to drive me everywhere I need to go. <laughs> Because I didn't the first time. Yeah. And I had to go everywhere on my bike and walk. So mm -hmm. it's put again, it's putting everything into context. And of course, all of the walking and all of the biking helped you be able yes. to do the Iron Man thing. So it's exactly. all grateful. And it's I love all good this stuff. Part. Yeah. All right. So I, going to I, I could this. have gone back into that um, I'm not a happy mindset. You know, we always have that option. And yet everything that you've done and everything that you've shared and what you've created and what you are giving to the people here, which is just so amazing. And I want to just finding your best path, which is what is you're giving to everybody is mm -hmm. such an amazing thing because that's been your journey. Your journey was to find your own best path. Yes. And We've got one piece left, <laughs> okay? I get the dream, not what I want. This is what I do want. I get the divinity. Good. Where does destiny play into this? That's why it's in there. Destiny is less about where you find yourself, but more about the journey you're meant to be on. Ah, so it's not destiny as a destination, which is where my brain went. Mm -hmm. It's destiny as this is the journey this and is, understanding that this is the journey you're supposed to have. Yeah. These are the life experiences that you're supposed to have. These are the, the, the destiny is, again, not it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. We've all heard that. But I've been able to understand that. Oh, I had you, never. Once, I never heard that destiny was not about the destination. Okay. I yeah, I mean, I heard that <laughs> life was not about the destination; it was about the journey. But I never heard it applied to the word destiny. And it's about our key life experiences, what our soul was intended to experience. That's what soul path provides us. 
emotional divination allows us to be aware of our feelings. Fearless living helps us be aware of our emotional fears. There's two primary feelings in life, fear and love. Which one are you going to choose? And, and, and the, back to choice, people. Yeah, here's somebody thought this was going to be all lighthearted and fluff. <laughs> No, it is back to choice. It always comes down to choice. But your destiny is about your life experiences, not where you find yourself at the end of the road. Cool. All right. Yeah. So life experiences are your destiny. And if you choose to stay here, you will have a lot of them. I promise you that. <laughs> so stay the course. Pure prevention. Go. Just keep choosing love. Just <laughs> keep choosing life experiences. Keep choosing to find out what else is available to you. What else could happen to you? Cool. And, and, and know, teens, that you have that ability to reshape your reality. And when you understand these concepts at such an early age, you're going to enjoy all of, you're going to appreciate all of your life experiences that much more. And so this is good for anybody of any age. Yes. And your gift is just amazing because you are giving the gift of your time. And so I just want to say thank you and encourage everyone to explore. And the link is in the chat and it's in the show notes. Ah, and Reverend Carrie Ann, thank you for being on the show. This was a beautiful, beautiful journey through dreams, divinity. And destiny. And thank you for helping me understand that destiny is not the same thing as destination. Exactly. You're welcome. Thank you for hearing that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <sighs> thank you. Thank you.